Oh, it's it's all word of mouth uh, that people call and text, and usually starts with a question like, uh, "You ever work with Lyme disease?" That's a common one now. Mm -hmm. Wyoming has Lyme disease now, uh, but it's different species of Lyme organism than we have in New England and California. Mm. And I had to find that out the hard way by. Um, having Lyme disease myself and being told that it doesn't exist, I couldn't have it because I was in the mountains for a month before I came down with it and I hadn't left 11,000 feet and I would have had to have gone to an eastern state in order to get Lyme disease or Northern California where it's been for a decade or two. And uh, so, I, as far as I know, I was first case in Wyoming, and I used that to learn about it because I really didn't know anything about Lyme disease. Yeah. That's one way to learn about things is um, come down with certain and, and medical issues and then try to figure your way through it. Uh, by the time I went for treatment, I already gone to stage two Lyme disease, and it's very hard to diagnose. Um, bor borreliosis is what it's called. It's uh, Borrelia uh, burgdorferi is the spirochete that causes this Lyme disease was thought to be the only one. Mm. But I was uh, doing research with a group of people interested in bighorn sheep diseases when I had to drop out and say, I can't even remember my name most days, so I can't be publishing papers with you guys mm -hmm. on bighorn sheep. So our uh, colleague in um, in Argentina, who was working with deer with selenium deficiencies, there, same thing we were working with here. He he said, "Did you know there's more than one type of Lyme disease?" And he sent me an ecological paper that had just come out. Uh, it was about uh, eight, nine years ago, on the species of Lyme Borrelia. And there were five different ones, possibly six. One was ocean going, lived in, on albatrosses. <laughs> but um, the one we have in Wyoming is a different species that probably is carried by different vectors other than deer ticks, mm. which would explain why I was fairly sure where I got it from uh, a black fly that was hoarding the bighorn sheep because I was very close to bighorn sheep every day. But at any rate, um, none of the standard medicines worked for mm -hmm. me and it continued to get worse over a period of six years until I ran into a alternative uh, Chinese practitioner, Chinese medicine practitioner, who gave me some Chinese herbs and it went away in a day. Never has never come back. So. I went from unemployable, could hardly walk, uh, to and neurologic symptoms, to paresthesia, uh, pains that were unexplained, that were debilitating, and uh, joint problems, arthritis. I couldn't play piano anymore, which really bothered me. <laughs> Plus, I couldn't work because I, I couldn't think very well. Cognition mm -hmm. was affected. Two, a day later, being completely recovered, so I. A tremendous uh, enthusiasm for spreading the word and I knew of a couple other people with the same symptoms that were also diagnosed as not having Lyme <laughs> I mean their diagnosis was we don't know what you have um, and they also recovered very quickly so um, I started treating people and the thing about some of these networks with things like Lyme disease is people hear about it and it becomes a network of people with a, a disease that's hard to diagnose and often untreatable. If you catch stage one Lyme disease early enough, you can treat it with doxycycline very efficiently. But once it goes to stage two, it's not treatable with doxycycline. And that's when alternative medicines work really well. And it turns out that the chemistry of the Chinese medicines I was taking also occur here in Native American medicine, medicinal plants. Mm -hmm. So I started asking people when they would call up and say, uh, I hear you've uh, dealt with Lyme disease. 
have any clues because I'm unemployed. I have pains that don't have any connection to reality and my joints don't work and I've been diagnosed with Lyme disease. So usually the first ones I got were people that were actually diagnosed with Borreliosis. And um, they responded very uh, quickly to the Chinese herbs, but then I asked a few that were up for experimenting if they would go with some experimental herbs that we can try. Because I was able to suppress my symptoms with osha root, which is a very, very popular Native American herb, popular in the sense of all of the tribes know about it and use it for lots of things. But it's a very effective uh, pathogenic uh, drug. It kills pathogenic bacteria and viruses, and there's very few things that kill viruses. So uh, this Borrelia organism is a spirochete, which is a type of bacteria and uh, it, we used osha root on a couple of people and it seemed to work right away. Uh, so that's what I use now because it's cheaper, it's easier to find, and uh, it's native. You don't have to import it. <laughs> so osha root combined with uh, fringe sage, which is equivalent chemically to the Chinese herb, which is I forgot the Chinese name for it, but it's, uh, the Latin name is Artemisia annua. And the one we have is Artemisia uh, frigida, and it has the same lactone glycosides in it, which kills parasites. Mm -hmm. So I'll use this plant. It's in, it's in uh, season right now. It's collectible. So I just grabbed this um, uh, right around my cabin and I dry these and keep them and make tinctures out of them. Mm -hmm. But Osha grows in the higher mountains, going over Togadi Pass. You can collect it there and keep a, a stock dried. It's only good for two years though, and I found that out by experimenting on myself because I was using Osha root in lower doses to suppress symptoms of Lyme disease. I didn't know at the time if I took it at the same level, the same dosage, and for the same period of time that you take the Chinese herbs, which is about a year, mm -hmm. then it doesn't come back. I would take it only when I had symptoms and it would make all the symptoms of Lyme go away. But that's how I learn about these things. I've learned a lot about it. I've had uh, back issues and, uh, uh, you know, the kinds of illnesses everybody comes up with. It occasionally, and injuries, and I, I try to find made uh, natural ways that are local to treat these things. So, the, the symptoms, are the, with Lyme's disease, the sy symptoms are different for everybody, is that? Yeah, what you're talking they, about tremendous symptoms? variability, hmm. and it has to do with the type of organism it is, it hides. It's not a normal, uh, ordinary bacteria that you run into in first year microbiology. It's a spirochete, and by nature they lose their protein coat on the outside, so the, any identity it has with your uh, immune system, mm -hmm. in terms of antibodies, are no longer functional. Mm -hmm. So it can hide from your own immune system after it's been identified by, mm -hmm. producing, by stripping its protein coat off and I'm producing a new identity when it reemerges, maybe a few weeks or a few months later. So I had recurring symptoms, and most people do, and when it comes back in three weeks or so, that was the average time it would disappear for me. I'd have symptoms, and then it would disappear for a few days. Mm. I felt normal, and, but then it would come back, and instead of arthritis in my hands, it would be arthritis in my feet mm. or fever. Mm. Or when it became stage two, it's mostly neurological. I went blind for a while, could not see anything, and I was on a road trip when it happened. So I was stuck on the side of the road in a place with no cell reception, <laughs> no cell phone at all, so I was on my own. Jeez. And it also had... Um, uh, affected my right leg, so 
so that didn't have motor control of my right leg. But I didn't know that sitting in my truck. So I pulled out at Green River where they have a historic turnout and you can look at the old Oregon Trail ferry crossing. And I was sitting in my truck unable to see for hours and then finally I started to get my vision back. And um, I saw some people that had pulled in, a couple driven to a spot far away from me and they were walking in my direction to look at the river, the Green River. And uh, when they got close I thought, well, I'm starting to get my vision back but I may lose it again. I'm going to ask them for help. And I opened the door and put my left foot out and then I swung around and tried to put my right foot out and I fell down. And I couldn't walk so I was climbing up on the door window to get myself vertical and waving at these people to get their attention. And of course I looked in every way like a drunk mm -hmm. and they turned around and quickly walked back to their car and drove off. <laughs> so I was stuck there for about a day and then the vision came back. So that's Lyme disease. It, it's very, very strange. Borreliosis is about as cryptic as uh, an illness can be as far as symptoms go. But all of them disappear. Uh, you actually kill the organism using OSHA root, which is well known for killing cryptic organisms, hmm. whether it be a virus or a pathogenic bacteria. Hmm. Um, <coughs> yeah, okay, so, and that kind of explains why it goes undiagnosed, because what do you test for? What do you, what do you see as an evidence or a marker of it? <laughs> right, so they've decided on things uh, in the medical profession. They have certain uh, criteria. There's five of them that you have to have at least three in order to qualify for some of the harder drugs they use. Mm -hmm. For like ceftriaxone is a, is a pretty serious antibiotic drug and you have to take it IV. But you don't qualify for that treatment unless you've had three of the five indicators. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't have those three mm -hmm. um, because it's such a cryptic symptomatology. Mm -hmm. you, you don't often have all of the required symptoms. So the bullseye bite site mm. is one of the things that only less than 50% of the people with Lyme disease get, but mm. that's one of the required mm. symptoms to be diagnosed with Lyme. And I didn't have it. Yeah. Uh. Um, and it, it makes me wonder what um, could there be adverse effects, though, of taking something potent enough to kill a Lyme's disease? Oh, yeah. Then OSHA... And is... that's part of the experimenting process, because OSHA is so potent, if you take it in a high dose, which is what I was really trying to determine with my experiments with people, is what kind of a dose can you take safely when you're in that high range of, of OSHA root? Because there's not really much in the literature on that subject. Mm -hmm. OSHA has been used for a lot of uh, infective, uh, pathogenic infections. But this was a new one, and there's nothing in the literature on it. So I went too high with one woman, and, and she killed off her uh, intestinal flora, as you would with Flagyl or a lot of drugs for Giardia. Mm -hmm. They're very potent drugs. There's nothing new in the medical world, to be, but it took her five, uh, was it? It took uh, two months before she started showing signs of uh, not being able to absorb mm -hmm. food and it was uh, she'd killed off her enteric bacteria and microorganisms. So we took her off of that and as it turns out that was enough time. So I learned two things that mm -hmm. didn't have to go a whole year because uh, she's now um, two years from that treatment and still has not had a recurrence of Lyme disease. Mm. Uh, but it all went away overnight and just the, the common phone call I get is, I, I'm indebted to you for life. <laughs> I no mm. longer have any symptoms and I say, well, wait, make sure it doesn't come back before you say that. Mm. Um, but that's usually uh, a long-term recovery. You can get it again, mm -hmm. but the treatment uh, lasts about two to three months and then it's um, 
it kills the organism. Yeah.